Jones, for those of you that don't know me, Adam Jones, I'm the principal here at the middle school. Uh, this is Dave Redinger, uh, my assistant principal here at the middle school. Um, we're, we're very lucky to have Phil Little here as a representative of the Attorney General's office. Uh, he was here last week, mm -hmm. um, and he talked to our students about some of the ills and things of social media. Um, I'm always amazed, and I tell the kids, you know, that we deal with it a lot. You know, you think kids who grew up in this environment of social media and technology would be more aware of the pitfalls of all of those things. And I tell them, we didn't grow up with that. So we should be the ones that are in the dark and don't have any clue about what could happen to you. But oftentimes during our day, we're reminded that we're actually more aware than they are. Um, and we deal with things that run the gamut from Instagram. Uh, we deal with things on our, our email accounts. Um, we just dealt with an incident. Uh, things over the weekend that pop up on all the different apps. Uh, so, you know, we have to learn kind of as we go, because when we catch <laughs> on with what the kids are using, they pop on and jump onto another app. We found out, you know, things like where they hide their pictures, things where you don't, you know, look all the time. We have kids that actually, we just had an incident, I think last week, where a student was actually using his mother's phone um, and there were pictures and things on the parents' phone, and they had no idea that they were on their inappropriate pictures. Um, so anything that you can imagine that could go wrong, you know, in that realm, um, we've pretty much dealt with. And, and Phil can tell you all kinds of horror stories and things that he's seen as well. But it is something that, um, you know, going forward as parents and as administrators, that we want to make sure that we get the message out. Um, and give you guys some, some skills to hopefully combat it. We have Tyler here from the high school, Tyler Vandenberg, Tyler Tech, so he's here filming this tonight, so for those that couldn't make it, we'll be able to put this on the website. So if you had friends or family members that said, I couldn't make it tonight, because I know it's Thanksgiving week, tell them to we'll upload it onto the website and they can see it. Okay, Mr. Redding, you're here. Um, just, there's representatives uh, out in the main lobby from Family Behavioral Resources. That is the, uh, organization that we contract with for school-based counseling services. Um, so they are licensed clinical counselors uh, that do counseling outside, but they also have counselors that come inside. Uh, different than the rule of guidance counselor, it's more of a clinical type counseling. So there's uh, information out there for anybody that might need that. Uh, there's information out there from big brothers and big sisters if uh, anybody's interested. Um, and there was uh, one other group out there. Brothers and sisters that they are and I think the other information <laughs> actually is from the uh, from your office. So. <coughs> Thank you for coming, though. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, go a little, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, can we hear me okay? Okay, great, great. <laughs> Screw has great acoustics. So if I don't have to hold something in my hand like a microphone, it makes it easier to my hand. Yeah. Off, right? So uh, first and foremost, I want to thank the school district for inviting me back. I was just here uh, last week talking to the students about some of the issues that we're going to unpack tonight. Uh, again, my name is Phil Little. I'm a specialist with the Pennsylvania Office of the Attorney General. Uh, and what we're really going to address is something that I call social media work. What we're really going to do, and my goal is very simple. Uh, my goal is to really give you more information in regards of understanding the pitfalls and dangers of social media and technology that our children use on a daily basis than what you had coming in. It really is quite that simple. Uh, this is not a high level thought process of, of I'm going to take you through the, the aspects of it. It's a very 101 course, hence the name, uh, giving you that foundational education and understanding. Some of the things that we often see that get our children jammed up. Okay, so I just wanted to give that preface. If anyone has any questions, you know, feel free to shout out. I, I like making this more of a conversation. So if you, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out and, and we can address them as we go along. So uh, the first thing I'd like to really address is, is talking about the timeline of social media and technology. I'm just going to put these all up here at once. Oops, apologize, I'm a little too fast. Uh, what you see below are the advancements in technology throughout the years, beginning about in the early, late 50s. On the top is the advancements of what I call were raw forms of social media. The reason I talk about this is because oftentimes people say social media is relatively a new thing. 
Well, when you really break it down, uh, the idea of where it's at is new and what we see now, but there were very raw forms of it when we really go and look back. And you can see what really expands those social medias is the technology that's being created. And you see really that boom, starting with the use of the home computer and then consumer grade internet entering the home, right? So when you look at what we call IRC, internet, internet chat relays, these are basically, uh, if you ever used the Microsoft Messenger, if you have it in an office, that's what that started as, right? You know, your AOL, Instant Messenger, if you may remember that. That's where that started. And you can see as it's going and going, and when we get up here into the mid-2000s, is what we see as the earliest form of social media that we now see. But the idea here is that technology and what we use on it goes hand in foot. When the advancements of technology occur, we see the advancements in what we would see of those forms of social media. In social media today, I mentioned a few things here. That there are hundreds upon hundreds of networking sites out there. Uh, the vast majority of the public is only aware of a minute portion of them, right? So there's, there's multiple ones out there. But the thing is, the vast majority of them, there's just little tweaks about what they do. Majority of it is all photo and video driven uh, on any of this. Does anyone want to guess why that may be? You just blurted out. Go ahead. It's harder to filter. <clears throat> it's harder to filter? Okay. It's harder, it, it's harder to, for a computer learning to understand what's in the content. Okay, it's harder for the computer to learn to understand what's in the content? Okay. Why else would we think this? Think about the culture we live in, too. I think that's an important aspect. Lots of people like to share. <laughs> Absolutely. Maybe you have a, a relative or a high school friend that no longer lives in, in Greensburg. Maybe they live in Michigan. You like to keep up. Hey, here's pictures of my kids, right? So we put them up there and it drives the media. I'd agree with that. I think one of the big things that we talk, we don't talk enough about is the society we live in. We live in this me, 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 look at me, look what I'm posting society. And you're seeing it alongside our youth. If you look at how many posts, uh, maybe a, a sixth grade child would put up, it's a lot in one day, some of them. So, I mean, it, you really are seeing that driving what the social media is. I often mention as well that the social media is very comparative to what I call the restaurant industry. What I mean by that is a restaurant can open up on 30, right? And whether it's good or not, it's new. People are going to rush to it, right? And it's going to be popular for a bit because it's the hot hip thing out there. And as quickly as it's become popular, it's going to die down. Uh, to give you a little perspective, I always tell this joke. I, I, I'm from the North Hills of Pittsburgh, and you guys are all familiar with the Ross Park Mall, right? Inside the Ross Park Mall, there was a uh, well-known uh, chicken sandwich store uh, that's a national chain. It's in the mall. At the foot of the hill where the Ross Park Mall is, on McKnight Road, the main road there, they opened up a standalone same store. People were parked around the corner. You would wait a half hour to get through drive through just to get a chicken sandwich from the store. But the thing is, that store has been in the community for years just as a cafeteria store, right? But it was new. People wanted to go to it. People wanted to see it and be a part of the new thing that was in that community. There are three of them here in Greenberg. There you go. <laughs> there you go. So I bet you if a fourth one opened up, though, people are going to go to it, right? And my point is this. As quickly as it became popular, you saw the drive through starting to trickle off, and it's a normal store now. But it's a very fickle industry. What's hot, people are going to rush to, just like social media. There might be something that could come out right now, as I'm speaking. Our kids are going to rush to it and use it. And then it's going to trickle off because something else is going to replace it. So that's what I'm talking about the comparative of the restaurant industry. I want to put in perspective now, and this is something I talk about with the, the young people here in this district when I was here last week is the computing power of these devices that we are putting in the hands of our youth. You know, I, I did a little poll in both the programs that I, I spoke to the students in. I said, raise your hand if you have access to something like this, whether we think of it being a phone or a tablet or something like that. And I would say it was a fair estimate that I would say uh, about 70% of the hands were up, 60 to 70%. That was a fair estimate, guess the name. And I often say, while well, we call those phones, while we call those tablets and things of that nature, when we understand how 
powerful they are, what we really truly should be calling them are supercomputers. They're tiny supercomputers that we're all carrying around in our pockets, or they fit in our children's backpacks or our purses. We carry them around our briefcases. And when you look at how much computing power these tiny supercomputers have, they have more power than NASA had in the 1960s for what it took to put a man on the moon. It really does become mind-boggling when you put that in perspective. That I have seen people, uh, students and children as young as second grade, walking around with a tiny supercomputer that has more computing power than a National Space Exploration Organization had for what it took to put a man in outer space. Proverbially, I often talk to parents that their intentions are good. They may want their kid to have the nicest or finer things, and they may work hard and get them that brand new iPhone, right? And they may think that their children will do the right thing with it, but if we don't give our children the proper training on a machine or a computer that's that powerful, it's almost like we're putting the keys of an exotic car in their hands and saying, now have at it, but don't wreck it. And when they do, using that device, we wonder why, right? I, I think it's really important that we just kind of take a step back and understand how powerful these devices are. One of the things that, that I, I, I conveyed with, with the, your children here when I was speaking was, whether we want to admit it or not, if we interact with these devices right here, we have a great responsibility to use a device that powerful correctly and respect it. Because when a device so powerful is misused or abused, it can cause jams of mass proportions. And it couldn't be any more true in some of the situations that I've seen, right? So I think it's really important that we really truly put in perspective how powerful these devices are that we are all walking around with and truly respecting them and using them for what their intentions are. Moving on here with social media, a little overview of, of a couple of things. I often mention to parents, and I mention this to, to the youth here, the, your children, is that all social media, you have to be 13 years or older to have an account. Right? When you register an account. Here's the thing. Uh, I can tell you throughout my travels, uh, through about half the Commonwealth here in Pennsylvania, uh, I've spoken to countless, countless people. If I were in a room, uh, let's say with 20 second graders, and I were to ask them, how many of you have your own social media account? And I'll make it very clear. It's not mom or dad or the adult you live with at home. It's not your older brother or sisters. It's your very own. And I make it very specific. And I ask them to raise their hands if they have their own account. Bless you. On average, I would say 9 to 11 hands will go up. I hope that I am not talking to any 13-year-olds that are in second grade, right? But that's telling me something. That's across the board, anyway. That we're stretching the truth about how old we are. And our kids know that when you have prod them a little more. And you say, did you know that? Well, yeah, because if I enter at an age less than 13, it won't let me have it, right? <laughs> so I wanted it. And they don't truly understand, as we do as adults, information sharing. Who can see this stuff? It can put me into that serious jam, right? I often have conversations with, with parents, and they'll say to me, Phil, look, uh, what's, I, I saw an article that said Snapchat was the worst social media app. I heard this was the worst social media app out there. I, I disagree. I don't think any of them were bad. I don't think any of them were worse than the others. What the problem is, is not the app, but the behaviors we exhibit using those apps that we consider normative. And we're going to talk about those, right? Snapchat's not bad if you use it for how it's intended. Facebook and Instagram, the same thing. But then when we use it uh, in, in a way that's not smart using it and, and, and not realizing it and using it in a way that can get us into serious jams, that is the issue. It's the behaviors that we are seeing being exhibited. And it's not even children, I would say. I'm sure you as adults could go on and see some of the, what I say, bonehead comments some people make uh, using social media, right? It's when we use it in a form that shouldn't be used. Right? Those are the issues, the behaviors exhibited while using those devices. The last thing, I often hear, and I'll probably get a question here, and that's fine. 
But I'll often hear parents say, can't I just put on this setting and then my kid can't do this or I'll know this? Yes. But the fact of the matter is, your child can turn that setting right off. When it comes to settings, it's more like a cat and mouse game. And we'll, we'll unpack some settings here, don't get me wrong. I think they're important. But I don't think that it's the say-all, be-all, right? Meaning, you turn on this setting, you came here tonight, and that's it. My kid's going to be safe. It's a component of it. But the other aspect is communicating with our children why we put that on. Why we do that so that we can keep safe. And we're going to talk about that here in a minute. What we're going to look at are just a few apps. Uh, some of the most popularly used apps, though, that our children use today. We are not going to look at Facebook. Does anyone want to guess why? Kids don't use it. Kids don't use it. Why don't they use it? It's for old people. Because you have it, right? You have it. Your parents. It's not cool once mom or dad has it. You kidding me? They may have an account, right? They may check it a little bit, but why would I want to use it if my mom or dad has it, right? They've moved on. Facebook is, is a dinosaur in the social media Right? It's been around now for over, well over about 14, 15 years, you would say, right? when you think of its form, right? So they moved on to different things. We won't look at that, right? I didn't even say the word Facebook while I was here talking to your children. Don't want to guess why. Because I would have lost them and I would have lost all credibility <laughs> because they look at me and go, you look like the adult that I live with at home who hands me their phone and says, I don't know what this cloud is. Can you just fix this for me? I, I, can you just fix this? I don't know how to use it, right? And I had that conversation with your kids about, I respect the fact that you know how to navigate a device better than anyone else out there. Meaning, how many of you have that scenario at home where the adult handed their device over and said, I give up. I can't figure this out. You fix it. So if I mentioned Facebook, this guy's like, Fraud, right? He doesn't know what we, you know. So I'm very careful with what I say uh, to our youth because you have to understand to be authentic and understand how they're using these things. I get that and I respect that. I truly do that our youth doesn't navigate those devices. I also respect the fact that they know what the latest and greatest technologies are and how to use them. But, but they don't understand the seriousness of who can see the information we're putting out there in the behaviors that are being exhibited. And that's really what we're gonna focus on after we look at a few of these apps. We're gonna look at the apps, how to navigate them, and how to uh, turn on some security settings that can keep our children safer in terms of two things. One uh, is in terms of the aspects of cyberbullying as we know, right? The harassment, the saying of nasty things, things of that nature. We'll relate in those terms. But the other term that we're going to turn and talk about is how child predators are using social media to contact children. No longer are they meeting children for the first time at the mall cafeteria, right? They're not meeting at the basketball game. They're viewing our kids' posts on Instagram. They're viewing what they're putting on Snapchat. And to make it even scarier, our children, because of the normal <coughs> behaviors, which we'll unpack, are letting them. That's what we truly need to talk about. Because we just simply do not talk about it enough. Okay? So is there any questions before we unpack some of the apps here? We're only going to go over a couple. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. The first one, Snapchat. How many of you recognize this app of maybe being on your child's device? Any hands? Show of hands here. Okay. So, Snapchat is a uh, phone-based application, right? No longer do a lot of people access these social media apps on a computer anymore. The vast majority are through the supercomputers we carry in our pockets, our phones, or our tablets. So what is Snapchat? Well, it's a photo and video sharing application. A little twist, though. The media that you send disappears, right? Notice how I use air quotes there. So to give you an understanding of, of what I'm talking about here, to give you a, a better uh, foundation. Ma'am, your name? Nicole. Nicole. Say Nicole and I both have Snapchat. I can send a picture of my dog to her. I can set a timer for how long she wants to look at it, one to 10 seconds. After that time, she laughs, the photo 
deletes. Notice I'm using air quotes every time, right? This is one of the big things that, that I talked about with uh, our children, is something called digital footprints, right? Nothing goes away in the sense that we think if I just delete something off of a phone, it truly goes away. I delete my browser history on my internet, it, it goes away, right? Digital footprints are incredibly real. Uh, law enforcement uses them on a daily basis, if need be, to track criminal activity. Uh, I've seen situations where young people thought, since I know how to navigate a device better than the adults in my life, I could use social media uh, any way I wanted to in the forms of the harassment and the bullying that you know it as. And if the adults in my life started to notice this stuff, I could just delete it, it's gone, and there's no proof, so you can't get me in trouble. Right? That's one of the things that, that I really had that hard conversation and being very honest with about our youth is that that's just simply not true. You can't just delete everything and it, it just goes away. Right? It's actually 60 Minutes just this past Sunday did a piece on where our data goes, who owns it, and things of that nature. <coughs> and it all deals with the user agreements that we all tap accept and barely ever read. It's saved on hard drives and shared or sold to organizations that we didn't even know were out there. And they may have it, right? So that's how digital footprints truly can exist, right? We may delete the, the post that we made, but it's still out there one way, shape, or form. And with enough manpower or, or searching, could be retrieved. So just to really put in perspective that aspect of what a digital footprint is, I often like to share with people uh, the amount of daily users the social media apps get. On Snapchat, you are looking at 187 million people will use their service in 24 hours. 187 million people. To put in perspective uh, how many people that is, the, the Commonwealth, the population of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is roughly uh, fluctuates between 12.7 and 12.8 million. Right, so over 10 times, well over 10 times, the amount of people in our Commonwealth alone will log on to Snapchat in 24 hours, right? Isn't that roughly half the population of the U.S.? Yeah, what's the U.S.? 367, does that sound right? 376? Something in that neighborhood. It's got a, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but it's right around there. So, some of the features Snapchat has. <laughs> One of them is called My Stories. Is anyone familiar with this? My Stories. You'll see it now appear in Instagram. You'll see it appear in Facebook now. What, what My Stories is, it allows you to sign photos or videos that you may have just sent to one person. Right? I gave you the example of Nicole and I. And I can assign it to My Stories. And it creates a collage of the videos, the photos that you assign there. And it shows you what you've done throughout the day. You can add filters onto the photos. You can put text over it. Uh, you can stick out your tongue and a puppy dog tongue comes out, right? And you have the puppy dog ears, all that fun stuff, right? You're laughing because you know it's true. <laughs> and those, that's what we're seeing this technology created, what was starting with, with Snapchat, right? So to give you some of the features. Some of the problems. Uh, Snapchat, several years ago, uh, has had thousands of their images uh, taken from professional hackers from their actual hard drives. So based on the photos disappearing, things of that nature, how do you think that this may be misused by youth? Inappropriate photos is where you would see some people use this. And people were saying there's significant others thinking it would just go away, right? And this was several years ago now. But they never thought those photos would resurface. Someone, people, an organization, people actually got into Snapchat's real hard drives, X Fully took out, extracted those photos, put them online for the world to see. Right? So th those are the things that you're seeing uh, with that stuff when it comes to the information you take. Another feature that not just Snapchat has, but the vast majority now uh, of all social media has something what I call the in-house texting feature. Uh, when we use texting as adults, we typically use an iPhone, you use that app right there, right? Or if you have an Android phone operating basis and you use something that looks like that, right? And you have your text message threads and you text because that's the app that came with the phone. I'm not saying all of our youth are doing this. I'm saying it's a thing, though. 
Check inside your child's phone to see who they're texting within the app itself. That's where you're going to see more activity and, and conversations. I can tell you I, I had this conversation with a gentleman uh, last year. He came to a program like this, and I just came back. It was probably about a month ago now. Uh, I came back again for a year to come back and speak to the parents again. He came up to me and said, hey, listen, last time you were here, you mentioned that. And I was just like any father. I thought I'd just check the text message app on my child's phone. And there were some text message threads on there. I thought, okay, whatever. But then I went on their Snapchat, my daughter's Snapchat, and I went in, and sure enough, there were threads. And one of them was from a boy in her grade, and they were communicating about sending inappropriate photos back and forth. I I'm not here to try to, to fear monger or anything like that. Please don't get me wrong. I'm just saying... You trust, but you check, right? This is maybe something you may want to look into, see who we're communicating with in, in those situations, okay? So let's talk about some of the settings here if you're going to enable keep our service. This is the home page for Snapchat. It's, it's rather bare. Uh, typically, you'll see someone's photo here or some type of video, uh, username, and things of that nature. But the main focus we want to talk about here is this gear button in the top corner. This, this gear button is the universal symbol for settings. Uh, if you're ever lost on a page, don't think that if you tap something you're going to mess it up and ruin it all. You're not going to. Let, if, you, if you're on a page and you see that, let that be your guide. And if I tap on that, that's that universal symbol for settings. When we get to that point, we have a couple of things that we can do to limit, and this is the name of the game, ladies and gentlemen, limit who can see what we're putting out there. So I want to focus on who can contact me, who can reach out to me and, and, and communicate with me, and who can view my stories. Understand this. These social media apps, they have no idea how restrictive or open they, you want your page to be. So guess how they treat it if you don't do anything. It's open. If you don't go in and change the settings, they treat it as if you want all 187 million people that get on in 24 hours to look at what you're putting out there. Now, if you were to tell that to a youth that goes against everything I'm about to say, they go, awesome, that's good. As an adult, that makes you cringe. It makes you worry. And we're going to talk about, and again, the name of the game is limiting what people can see of the content you're putting out there. That goes against the normative behaviors in the culture of the mindset of the, the young people in our lives uh, of when using social media. We're going to unpack that here at the end. But again, who can contact me? Can all 187 million people send my child photos and videos? I don't have to connect the dots here for you on that one, right? That's a little I don't know about that. Or just friends or friends of friends, limiting who can see what they're putting out. Who can view my stories? Can all 187 million people or just my friends? Again, limiting who can see what they're putting out there, okay? So we're gonna move on here to the second uh, most popular social media application, Instagram. Anyone here use Instagram? Usually you see some adults that'll use it, dabble in it. And, and this is one of the things that uh, is it, everyone's familiar with Instagram. Let me ask that question. Okay, okay, great. I, I often laugh at this because what is Instagram? It's a photo and video sharing application. What did I say Snapchat was? A photo and video sharing application. So this is the explanation that I got from some high school students once. I was sitting in a high school talking to 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. I said, you guys, you know, probably get on, open up Snapchat, and they all started laughing. I'm like, said Snapchat, and I went, whoa, sorry, what, what, what are we using now, right? And, this, and the one guy in the front, student, he looked up at me and went, buddy, Snapchat's for middle school students. We use Instagram. Uh, like, like, you know, like I'm so sophisticated. <laughs> I went, cool, I will remember that, man. I, I'll relay that, okay, okay. Is there a certain grade that this happens, you know? Right, but, but that's how it was explained to me, to a student. It's the more sophisticated. I don't know if that's true, but I thought it was a funny story to share. But again, it's a photo and video sharing application. 
Uh, no different. The only difference between the two is the photos disappear, right? Using any photo or video that you have posted is on a space that you've created on your profile. People can go back that you've accepted to look at your information and can go back since the beginning of that account, anything you've posted, and look at it, right? It's all still there. It has a lot of Facebook-like feels, meaning that you can use hashtags and likes and comments on the posts that are being put out there as well. When you're looking at the daily users, half a billion people use Instagram in a 24-hour period. So uh, while I do not know the exact population of the United States, I know that it is not 500 million. So more of the population uh, of our country alone uses Instagram in 24 hours. It really puts in perspective the amount of traffic these sites are getting in these applications. So some Instagram issues with that truly, I don't know if it's just, I would say it's not just Instagram, it's social media in general. Young people use likes, views, and comments they receive on things they post to validate their popularity. I'm going to share with you a story about a sixth grade girl in Washington County who had over 6,000 followers on Instagram. And why? And it feels that first point. Strangers on any of these social media, if we don't restrict, can send messages and send information to these people who are using it. And a lot of the media, not even on just Instagram, but you see it more because it's photo and video driven, if you're not careful, you can stumble across some pretty dicey material pretty quick when you're searching, right? And these parents, I see a few heads shaking, you're going, oh yeah, it didn't take long. And you can find some stuff pretty quickly. Maybe you probably don't want your sixth grade child seeing at that point, right? So it, it, those are some of the issues that we're seeing. Other things is, remember I told you there's nothing wrong with social media, it's how we use things. This is a prime example. Hashtag. Nicole, I'm just going to pick on you since you were in the front. If I were to ask you what that symbol is, what would you tell me that is? I would have thought it was like the number symbol. The pound sign on a phone, right? Good thing you didn't mess this up. Yes, that's what I wanted you to say. But if I were to ask a second grader what that symbol is, same symbol, they're going to tell me it's not a pound sign on a phone, it's a hashtag. And I think that's interesting. We see there's a generational gap there. We see the same thing interpreted differently, right? So what is a hashtag? Well, it's used to create group conversations online. So I'm going to use this example here. When you use the pound sign or the hashtag with word uh, coming after with no spaces, that becomes a link. So what I took right here is if you watch Fire Space Law, it tells you to use Let's Go Bucks. And if you use that hashtag and post something on Instagram, when they come back from break, they may put your photo up on the big screen at the game in your message. How fun, right? Or you can create group conversations of talking about Pirates baseball. They call it trending, right? That's a big thing. How it's used to create it, how it's used correctly is if you tap on this, it becomes a link, it would take you to a page where any post, whether it's words or photos or anything, where someone used the exact same hashtag as you is on a page. You can sort through whoever's used the same hashtag and what they posted. So for example, Pirates Baseball is smart. If they use that and you tap on Let's Go Bucks, you're going to have warehoused everything about Pirates Baseball, right? That's what you're going to see. You may see something here and there that is unrelated to it, but that's how it's used. That's how it's proper. How we see it improperly used is a mechanism, a vehicle for group shaming. I use that hashtag right there. Uh, as a very mild version, as adults, if you want to see what the real stuff is like, I would encourage you to Google uh, cyberbullying or harassment hashtag example, something like that, and be get ready to be kind of very disappointed. Uh, that's the only way I can say it. Very, very shocked. Uh, how this works is, even if you aren't participating in posting, you know what's going on in your school because you, we've all been in school. We know, how, we know know how work travels fast. You could just know what the hashtag is, search for it, tap on it, and you can see everything that's being said all right there. It's warehoused for you. Just like I said, let's go boxes. And you may not be posting, but now you're reading it, and it's like a real-life reality TV that's occurring, and you know the players because they go to school with you, right? 
And it's used to group shame that one person, right? And it, it grows quickly. So that's how we've seen it being inappropriately used. Excuse me. Tag is another example that we see in, in different forms of social media. Uh, raise your hands if you're familiar with the concept of what tagging is. Okay, a few people are. Right? If you're not, simply, and the easiest way to put it, this is what it is. <coughs> Excuse me. And Nicole and I both have Instagram. Her and I take a picture together right now. If I have Instagram, like I said, she can upload the photo, and she can tag me in the photo, identifying me by my username. And without me ever putting the photo up myself, it would appear on my page. Right? That's how it's appropriately used. That's the process of tagging. What's the big deal? Well, there's a big deal when it's inappropriately used. Is when, excuse me, uh, people will tag someone in a photo they don't want to be tagging with the intent to embarrass them. Maybe an unflattering photo. I'm not talking about inappropriate photos. I'm just saying maybe someone made a funny face. You know, you'll see someone, you catch someone. If you take a photo of me right now, I'm talking. It's going to look strange, right? They post with the intent to embarrass them. I've seen someone Photoshop someone's head or an animal head onto someone else's body, tag them in it with the intent to embarrass them. Things of that nature. You're, you're picking up on how we're seeing it now. That's how it's inappropriate. And if word spreads spent throughout school, that can be crushing to that person, right? So just to give you an idea. So some of the settings that we can enable using social media to, to alleviate those situations. Again, this is a very blank slate of uh, what a profile is. When a real profile would have different squares down here representing the pieces of media that have been uh, put up since their profile was adopted or since the profile was created. For story's sake, I just want to focus in the upper corner again on the gear. The gear is the universal symbol for settings. When we open that tab on the gear, we have some options. The first thing I want to talk about is making our accounts private. For any social media, by the swipe of a finger, we can limit, you know, half a billion people, look at what we're putting out there, or just our friends, right, with one swipe of the finger. Scrolling down on this side. I want to talk about the idea of photos of you, right? This is the idea of tagging and that situation that I told you about being tagged in a photo you don't want to be tagged in. Again, the default setting is it may just go up automatically without your permission. You can go in and change that to add manually. So let's say someone wanted to, Nicole wanted to, everyone to not like me in school. She could, you know, tag a picture of a pig's head on my body to intend to embarrass me. If I had it set to add manually, Instead of it going up to the public, it would say, I've been tagged in a photo. Do you want this to go up? Obviously, I'd click no. And now that situation has stopped, right? But again, it's up to us to go in and make sure that we enable those settings. This last app I want to talk about is not a social media app, but it goes hand in hand with one of the behaviors that can't say every, but almost every school that I've ever gone into, talking to teachers, talking to principals and superintendents, they struggle with. Uh, this is secret apps or ghost apps, you may have heard of them. Is anyone aware of what these are? Any show of hands here? Okay. Um, there is hope. I'm just going to preface a few things. There is hope. Uh, please do not, uh, after this part, say I'm just never going to give my kid their phone back and rip it out of their hands. Please don't do that, right? I'm just showing you. What can happen, I'm not saying everyone's doing it, but I'm saying it, it does happen, okay? So, what are secret apps? And that's what an app is right here. So, let's just do a little survey. If you saw that on your kid's phone, what do you think that is? Calculator. Calculator, absolutely. It's not a trick. Well, that's an actual photo of the app, by the way. So, what are secret apps? They're dummy apps disguised to look like everyday applications that you would overlook. And they allow you to hide media within the app that wouldn't normally appear, like photos and videos, on the camera button or the photo app, right, where you know where the media is. So with knowing those two pieces of information, what do you think this is used for? Uh, right, like the inappropriate photos. Almost every school struggles with the sharing at one point in time, has struggled with sharing of inappropriate photos. I don't know what goes on here. I'm not going to pretend like I do. Uh, but I'm sure that I could ask 
to the professionals here that work here, if they've ever had this issue arise in their career here, undoubtedly they're going to say, yes, it has popped up at least once, right? This is an issue that is a normative behavior of sending inappropriate photos. That's a big issue, right? You, you get it as parents. Not just one person is seeing these things. They, it can blow up to mass proportions where entire schools have. There's some criminal activity that comes along with this, people being minors sending photos like that, right? So you, you understand those aspects. But this is how we've seen some of these things be. So let's take you through uh, the secret app itself. So that is the actual button on the phone. And your child's phone is just littered with apps all over that screen, right? So let's say you tapped on that that button, right? Well, guess what? It looks like a calculator if you tapped on it, and it functions like a normal calculator. So theoretically, you could download this, never put photos or videos in it, and just use it as a calculator. But here's the thing. Why would you do that? Because your phone comes with it, right? But what happens is, is when you very first get this app, it'll ask you to enter a password to get like an ATM PIN number. You hit OK. And the next time you open the app, you have to enter the right pin, one, two, three, four. And in this case, the percentage sign is the enter button. Once you enter in the right pin number, this screen drops down, and all the photos and videos that mom and dad can't see, that's, that's what I labeled this. I don't know why, if I was a kid, I'd want to hide the photo of me and grandma, but I just put something in there, right? But you get the picture, right? You get the picture. I, I share this story. Because on my travels, talking to parents, I once had a gentleman who told me he was, worked in an Apple store. And the one day, he came across this and didn't know what it was. But the situation occurred where, <coughs> excuse me, he's opening up the store and this mother, in what he said he thought was probably maybe a 13-year-old boy, uh, come walking in. And the mother tells him, I want to set up an appointment to figure out this phone. I just got him this phone. Uh, you know, it has an absurd amount of space. I think he said it had 128 gigs, which is a lot of space. You could probably fit the whole Godfather trilogy on that phone, right? Just to give you an idea how space that is. I got it for him last month. The, uh, he can't add another photo. He can't add another song. Nothing. There's no space. What's going on? Help us out here. I spent a lot of money on this. So he said, okay. And again, he doesn't know this app exists yet. But he said, okay, this is what we can do. He asked the, the, the kid first, hey, hey buddy, what's, what's going on with this? And he said, I don't know. You know I just, uh, right? He said, okay. What we can do is we can go into settings and we can sort what app is using the most space on your phone. So he does that. And he notices at the top this button, and it says it's a calculator, is taking up a, a gargantuan amount of space. I think he said something like 80 gigs. Okay? Again, he has no idea what it is. All he knows is that this calculator is taking up 80 gigs. He's going, buddy, this, this is a calculator. It's, it's taking up over half of your phone. Why, why, what, what is this? And you know his parents. You can read your kid like a book. I guess evidently he just... I don't know what that is. I, I, I don't know. You know, and the mom knew immediately <laughs> that something's going on. I guess she kind of bent it, probably bent his ear in the store, to which he confessed, gave the pin, and uh, he was hiding all the photos and videos that he's had his friends and the school were sharing for a long time. <laughs> Excuse me, to the point <coughs> that he came into the Apple store thinking that they wouldn't figure that out, and they did around that. And not saying every single child is doing this. I'm saying it happens. My advice to you is this. If Junior has two calculators on their phone, you might want to have a conversation, right? You might want to have a conversation. Yeah? Well, how, if you're saying you could use that like a calculator, how do you know it's the secret one versus the real one? Or how do you know that? That one right there is called High HI Calculator. It's at one point the most popularly downloaded app. On social, on the app store, how you can tell is, I, I would say, because they look very similar. Look at the one that came with your phone, right, and look at what that app looks like, and then look at that one. How you can tell with this one is the colors are uh, on the real one of the phone. Uh, 
this is actually orange and this is actually gray and it's not a square. There's a couple things there, right? Just to give you, give you, give you an idea. So I want to really address this last part here, which is incredibly important, is the overall social media and tech issues. We've already discussed the idea of digital footprints, so we'll, we'll skim over that. I want to share a few passwords. Know your children's passwords. Know them inside and out, keep up to date with them. The reason I talk about this is because, heaven forbid, a child were to go missing, and, and law enforcement may want to get a lead on them, see who they were last communicating with, right? To find out where they could start looking. What they'd probably do is come to you as the parent or guardian and say, do you have the passwords for your child's Instagram account? If you were to say no, due to shows, crime shows out there on the different networks, many people believe that all law enforcement agencies have that socially awkward guy or gal who's a little quirky, wears glasses like me, and then comes into your house and hacks into your computer, right? Because we see it in the movies. Does not work like that in the real world. I'm on television, I'm going to do that, that's great. But you get the idea, right? It doesn't work like that. That's the movies. In reality, is that you have to go through the correct legal channels. And the legal process is slow. And it can take days upon days upon days. The best case scenario sometimes may be 48 hours until you have those passwords to get in to start looking. That's a very slim chance of it happening, but it could happen. But here's the thing. In 48 hours, you could be anywhere. When it comes to missing persons cases, the first, the first 48 hours are the most critical. After 48 hours elapsed, the chance of getting back that person alive drastically cut down. That's why I urge you to, to know your kids' passwords, communicate with them, and, and make sure you're keeping up to date. The normative behaviors. You heard me kept on saying normative behaviors, normative behaviors, normative behaviors. Here they are. These are the things that I don't care if it is uh, social media they're using, online gaming. It is anything that our children have the ability to communicate with the outside world and gather followers and things of that nature. These are the issues that, that are happening. Our children are in what I call a social media arms race amongst their peers to have the most friends or the most followers than their friends because it equates to popularity. I once went to a school in Washington County, and I did the same survey here, where I asked, and I'll say, on any given social media account, guys, raise your hands if you have 100 more friends. All the hands go up. 100 is easy, right? Even I have 100 friends. You go, I go up in increments of 100. This school in Washington County, I had to get to 6,000. So uh, the, I continue with my program in an auditorium like this. I tell the after the program's over, I, I tell her to stick back real quick. So her and her teacher stick back, everyone leaves. And I start talking to her, and two things happen, and it happened here. When you go up in the numbers, and this proves my point, I, I explain this to your kids. As you go up in the numbers, they start getting louder. <coughs> they start getting louder and more louder. And then the heads start turning. And if you're not to them like this, you'll hear creaking of chairs like crazy. Because everyone's shifting their bodies, trying to figure out whose hand's still up. Who has the most followers? And one of the things you may sometimes see is that one person, just their hand, with the badge of honor going, yep, keep on going, buddy. I can do this all day. <laughs> you know, he's going to get to 5,000. I know it. Wait, my hand's staying up, you know? You'll see that. And it happens everywhere I go. Because we believe the more friends and followers we have equates to popularity. And I asked that sixth grade girl the same I said to her, listen, you know, I don't know you, and I don't know anyone here. I'm not going to you know, tell on you, but you were just messing around when you did that because everyone got super excited, right? She said, no, no, I have, I have 6,000 followers. So I'll prove it to you right now. She pulls out her phone, taps on Instagram. I'll never forget it, 6,032, right? So in my head, I'm going, there's no way. You're in sixth grade, right? So I say to her, I go, did you buy followers? Because you could, there's processes where you can do that to inflate your numbers. Famous people do that. And what made me laugh was she just fired back and said, I'm not kidding. She goes, I'm in sixth grade. Where did I get the money to buy followers? And, you know, a dog. <laughs> now, fair point. Fair point. But I'm just trying to do this checklist, right? I'm just trying to figure this out. 
I've asked her a few other questions. And I said, how do you 6,000, 6,032 to be exact? She said, simple. I'd have time to waste after school. I'd get on Instagram. I'd send follow requests to people, tap the phone. I'd get them back that day. They would send a follow request back to me. I'd follow them and it just started going. It, I'd probably do it, I don't know, a half hour a day, 20 minutes a day. It took a few months, several, uh, but then I, I, I'm at where I'm at. I got over 6,000 followers. I did the old fashioned way. Now, you know as well as I do that she doesn't know all those people. And, and I said, why would you waste your time? And this is what she told me. She said, you know, if I have more followers than anyone in school, people are going to talk about that. I put up a photo or a video. That means if I have more followers, I'm allowed to get more likes than anyone else in my school. More views on a video and more comments. She said, did you know just last week, I put up a photo, and within less than an hour, I had 400 likes. And people in school are going to start talking about that. And if they talk about it in school, they're going to talk to me, which means I can become popular. And I, I got it when she said that. I mean, she said it with such conviction. An absolute certainty. But what we don't realize is, is that our kids being in that social media arms race and that mentality of what I just explained to that sixth grader, that culture exists in, in the vast majority of schools like it. They might openly admit it, but by taking that survey and the behaviors that are exhibited through the survey, it proves my point in every single school. That mentality, that sixth grade girl, that culture exists in, in, in almost every school I walk into. This school is not immune to it. Every school, it's almost like and to have more friends and followers than anyone else, they'll accept follow requests from people they don't know. And they do gain one more follower, right? But that is where predators know. Our kids are in that social media arms race. They'll create a fake profile and send that follower request. This is a man that we arrested several years ago. I showed this picture to your children. Didn't tell them the story I'm about to tell you, but I said this to them. If this guy sent you a follow request, and I'm not saying that's a mugshot, but if you saw an old guy like that, he used his real photo and sent you a follow request on Instagram, what would you guys do? They all yelled out, he's creepy, no way. <laughs> and yeah, right? Deny. He knew that. That's why he didn't look like that. He had a thorough account with a backstory pretending to be these two accounts. Anthony Rip Navari and Bill Cano, two young surfer guys who lived out of state, who had a relative who lived where this man lived, who was going to connect them together. He was grooming children. And guess what? When they sent, when he, him controlled these accounts that looked like someone their age, they sent the friend request, it worked. Kids would say, I'm not really saying, but the idea, I don't know him, but whatever, he looks like me, whatever. <clears throat> Okay, whatever. Right? And when we accept a follower request, we open the door for people to see every single thought, feeling, photo, and video we've ever shared. It doesn't take a lot of information to really figure out the lives and the trap behaviors of our children because they have a small world that they live in. They don't travel great lengths, right? This is really where I, I tell you as parents and guardians. Go through your friends and followers lists of your, of your child. If there's someone on there they do not know, get them off of there. I talked to your, the kids here about that. And we define what knowing means, right? What I told them is this. Knowing someone is someone you go to school with. Knowing someone is someone you do extracurricular activities with that you may not go to school with. A traveling baseball team or dance team. Something like that. Maybe a relative. Knowing someone is not, I play Fortnite with them, I talk to him on a headset, he's from Chicago, now we're friends, right? You guys get the picture. You never met him. You don't know him. You have no idea who's on their side of that voice box. But yet the idea and the concept of knowing someone has changed in that generational shift. I, I try to convey and truly share with our children that the amount of followers you have means nothing. I, I kind of share this story. 
I told them to go home and ask you as parents. If, if, I said, if you have an adult you live with at home that works, go up to them and ask them, hey, did your boss ever come up to you and ask you how many followers you had? And if you told them a high number, they got excited and gave you a promotion. Because if they did, then I'm wrong. But I have yet to have someone come back and tell me that that's happened. You know, I made a joke about it, but you're in a <laughs> I can never use that example ever again. No, I get you. I get you. There, 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 are, there are reasons why. I, I'm fully conscious. I get it. But my point is this. Our kids believe that that really means something. I have met children who value their virtual persona more than they value their real persona. That's real. I just shared a, or read an interesting article uh, that, that deals, and I, I like to put this in perspective. Interviewer, a uh, reporter, was talking about his time in, in interviewing Steve Jobs throughout his career since past, right? The founder, the CEO of Apple, who catapulted to what the technology we use. He said he was there for the, the unveiling of the iPad. He's talking to Steve before he goes out and said, Hey, you know, I've been playing with this thing. You guys gave us a demo version. It seems really great. What do your kids think of it? He said, What do you mean? He said, well, you have to, you're, you control the, the coolest tech company in the world. People wait in line for days to get one of your phones. You have to let your kids tinker with the thing, right, before, you know, you unveil it to the public. He said, no, no, unless they're using something for educational purposes, they don't, they don't touch the stuff we create. That told me something. And then the article went to go on that he thought that that was very interesting, that the guy who's creating all this stuff isn't letting his kids just use it aimlessly. And he started interviewing other, let's say, uh, prominent uh, business people, CEOs of companies. And what he noticed was that other people were saying the same thing. No, 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 not using it all the time. No, that's, no, we're, not, we're not doing that, right? I'm not saying there's a rhyme or reason to it. I just find that that's incredibly interesting that we have someone who created this stuff that we're not just, he's not just shoving it into the hands of his own flesh and blood and using it, right? I really truly believe that, that technology is great when there's a purpose for it in, in you know, healthy doses of it. I told your children that the things that I discussed tonight in different terms all comes back to the idea that you're carrying tiny supercomputers around. And with such great power those devices have, when misused, like Tagging someone in a photo with the intent to embarrass them. That can blow up to mass proportions of situations where it's now in harassment. Law enforcement's involved. You're suspended from school. That's an easy one. Other situations, using this tiny supercomputer by accepting all the followers you can get on Instagram because you need to be popular. And someone starts contacting you who is a predator. And heaven forbid something happens to someone. That's a situation of a mass proportion. I don't know what else is. It really comes back to having those conversations and really making sure that we're using this stuff appropriately. I know I've shown you all those settings. It's not to say I'll be on. It's a component. But I have a feeling that you already know what I'm about to say, that it starts with the communication, right? I'm a firm believer you can have a conversation with anyone if, at any age, if the conversation shaped appropriately. This stuff is very real. I'll leave you with one last point. And this is just in my experience as a trap. Do not, please, the word of advice, do not let your device, child's devices uh, charge in their bedrooms. They charge in your bedroom. Or they charge in a common area. I can't tell you how many times I've had a principal or an administrator tell me they have seen situations that have blown up mass proportions where two parents are now calling saying, These, my, our kids are fighting using social media and they print out all the printouts of everything and you can see the timestamp when they're communicating. Two in the morning, three in the morning. They went to bed at 10. Remember when your parents told you nothing good happens after midnight, you know? <laughs> yeah, they told me that too. I like to think it's the same idea. Nothing good on social media happens after bedtime get it out, right? So we don't have that temptation. On the other side, 
is that our kids are in a tiny room with a bright lit screen. That fires your brain. Now you can't get down to rest. And now they come to school. They have a lot to get in. They need to learn, right? And their brains aren't fully rested and ready to get that eight hours worth of, 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 of less. That, that, that domino effect that you're seeing there. So again, my goal was very simple. It was simply to give you a better understanding and a foundational education and knowledge than of these things and these issues than what you had walking in here. I hope we achieved that tonight. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to stick after. Uh, or here, if we have a few minutes, I, I can answer a few in public. But uh, after that, I'll be more than happy to answer them privately because I don't want to keep everyone in their seats. So, any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, typically they do. So Facebook jail. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, if you use like a song in one of them, the, the, typically there are algorithms in those social media apps for uh, intellectual properties and things of that nature. That's that's typical, but it won't do it for pictures and stuff like that. Well, uh, not, not to my knowledge, I haven't seen. Not to say that's now, right? Because I I can't tell you that I know every single thing. That's just if I know more than the average parent. Uh, but it's typically, if you're putting up, uh, if you'll see a big thing on social media, people will try to film maybe a pay-per-view that just happened, maybe a boxing match or wrestling, um, or a concert or a movie or a show. There's algorithms to figure out that you're showing that and it'll, it'll kick it off. Songs, those are big. Those are the biggest things. So inappropriate pictures would still not be flagged? <laughs> Not really. Typically, typically, it takes a little bit. It wouldn't just happen right off the bat. Those things can happen. There's something called flesh content. Without getting super high or hierarchy of this, there are algorithms that can't happen. From what I understand yes. about the audio piece of it and the video piece of it, there's actually audio that we can't hear that tells us what type of song it is. Sure, there probably is. I don't know the algorithms inside and out. All I know is you put something up there that's of intellectual property that someone owns. Uh, it, they, it can get flagged and, and they'll pull it, right? Yes? Yeah, this is not super high. This is about as dumb as we get. That's no dumb question. <laughs> yeah, it's like, okay, it, it, it's very hard to be young. Yeah. These kids watch videos of these kids. They were opening Star Wars figures, and now they'll sit and they'll watch these kids with father play for, They'll watch people play Fortnite. Mm -hmm. Now, these people are getting famous, and I, you know, I think, you know, these people are getting famous. We're making stars out of these people. These people are getting reality shows. They're getting, you know, we in society are making stars out of these kids, it's a stupid thing, you know, and that's. I would agree. Yeah, that's, that's my problem. I would say it's a fair statement. Our kids no longer, when you, we all grew up, you hope to uh, become famous and try to get on TV, it's how you do it. It's not how do it anymore. You cut a video, post the YouTube, and pray it goes viral overnight. That's the world that we live in. So you are absolutely right. There are people out there who make money literally opening up toys and showing you the, you know, the pretty pony and Here's the accessory, it comes with it. There are people out there, I can't, we know them. And they make a handsome side. It's also like the amount of people that go on to pay professional sports compared to everyone who tries doing that, right? It's a very minor thing. There are people out there, uh, I'll do you one better. There are people you pay a premium to watch them play Fortnite. You pay them money to watch them play video. Yeah, that's right. There's a market out there, they'll do it. Uh, I, I would say it's a fair statement, is that we are putting these people on pedestals that what are they really doing? Well, sure. Well, that's a good question. Well, Well, I would say that it's the idea of this. The control of putting out information to a mass amount of people was that people who had control doing that were your major television companies, right? But because of consumer-grade technology and the advancements of technology, the ability to put something out now and reach masses, anyone can do it. 
podcasts, you can, if you have enough, right, if you are appealing enough and have the right content, you can have millions of people listen and tune in to you on a weekly basis. You just cut the middleman being radio out of the equation. You did. Because you have the ability to do all of that on your computer. That's the reality. You too. You have the ability to cut the television network out of the equation if you have the right content to get the people, right? We're forgetting the idea here. So I, I couldn't agree more. I will share with you this interesting piece. This is a personal story. How many of you uh, in the fall of been three years ago now, I believe, 2015, remember the viral video of the New York City subway rat carrying a piece of pizza? Called a pizza rat. Do you remember that? It's kind of here and there. That was my brother who filmed that. Okay? It's not that cool. Please don't see it. Let's not give him too much credit. Okay? Um, love him, but here's the story. He sent that to me. I, I could have been here early. He sent it to me. He lives in New York City. Uh, at like midnight, I wake up the next morning at 5 a.m. and see it. And I go, well, that's neat. And it's not viral. Like, you know, the world doesn't know it. I go, well, that's kind of funny. He texts me at noon that day. Get on a computer and go to Yahoo. You know, there's the headlines. The same video that he sent me, I'm looking at as the world's news. I go to take my personal phone and swipe it to the left, right? Or swipe to, yeah, swipe to the right, from the left to the right. And you can get the headlines of the world. I'm now seeing a world headline as the same video that my brother sent me personally at midnight. In 24 hours, he was on the major news networks. I'm not just talking about our countries, but the world's. He, they did a write-up piece on him in GQ magazine. He won an award <laughs> on a Webby. <laughs> he didn't do anything. I worked my whole life and never got anything like that, right? Talk about jealousy. Is it coming through? You can tell now, huh? My, my point is this. He's in show business, and he already had an agent, so he was able to, to navigate these things. He had to literally copyright that as intellectual property, because everyone wanted to use it. Uh, there was a movie, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles made a movie the next year. They had to pay him thousands and thousands of dollars to use that in the movie. He made a substantial amount of money off it. The New York Yankees minor league baseball team had a survey, a contest, that on Saturdays, they would no longer be called the Yankees. I think it was the Staten Island Yankees. They just did it this summer to show you it's still relevant there. That there were three choices that you could vote for to rename the team. And I'm talking the jerseys are now this, the hats, merchandise is selling hot off the shelves. Does anyone want to guess what the Staten Island Yankees are called <laughs> on Saturdays? Yes, the Staten Island Pizza Rats. You can look it up right now. All because of this video. What they don't tell you is this. The people that come out of the woodwork. My brothers had to spend tens of thousands of dollars in litigation by people saying that that is a fake video, that he's in cahoots with people he's never met with trained rats, and he's had to defend himself from different magazines saying, I know the real story. That's real. It's almost, he came to me when he was here last Christmas and said, it's almost to the point, like, why? I wish I'd even come across this thing. Because I have reporters saying, I know the real story. You want to tell the truth, right? It's like, my, the truth is, I'm just some dumb guy that was walking down the subway and just so happened to come across this. There's not this smoking gun theory. And I've lost thousands of dollars having to prove in court that that's the case. They don't tell people that, right? No one ever makes it. That's a vast majority. You know, the very slim majority of people get to that point. But our kids see the Jake and Logan Pauls, right? And all that stuff. A very slim majority of people ever get to that point. And we, we really need to put in perspective you know, who are real people we should be admiring. Our teachers, our law enforcement, our firefighters, our parents. You know what I mean? Our everyday people that may not seem that extraordinary, they're the ones that make the world happen, right? My brother, uh, my brother, he filmed a rat and it became popular. If the rat video didn't exist, okay. The teachers didn't exist, way different, right? Get my point? So we really need to put it in perspective. That's, that's a tyrant. I know we've gone off, but you're right. You're, you're absolutely right. 
Anything else I can answer? Yes, sir.
You might hide, so we'll find you. <laughs> so thank you guys very much. I'll uh, put out a messenger whenever the video is online um, for everybody to view. So thank you very much.